We live in an increasingly divided world where our political parties, religious convictions, and personal identities are used to polarize and pit us against one another. As the ancient prophets wrote, a house divided cannot stand. This division is literally tearing our world apart. The only path to create true and lasting healing in our world is to come together with civility, respect, and honesty, sharing our stories and discussing our perspectives across our deepest divides. Welcome to the Patchwork Podcast with author, pastor, and activist, Brandon Robertson. In every episode, we seek to cultivate compelling conversations to help bring clarity and understanding to some of the most controversial topics of our day, with the hope of bridging our collective divides one conversation at a time. So thank you for joining us on this journey together. Let's listen to this week's conversation. Welcome back to the Patchwork Podcast. This is Brandon Robertson, and I'm so glad that you're tuning in as we're starting what I'm calling season two of the podcast. We kind of had a soft uh, start of the podcast last spring, and then I wanted to take some time off to kind of uh, re-envision where we want it to go as a podcasting team and what would actually be helpful to the broader conversation that I see that needs to happen in our country and in our world at this moment. And so last season, we really kind of focused in on the intersection of social justice and spirituality. And that makes sense because I'm a pastor, I'm an activist, I'm a consultant in those areas. But I also really wanted to have this podcast be a tool that served the listeners more than just bringing you conversations with people that speak the same kind of language we speak, that care about the same kind of issues that we care about. I want it to bring on people that actually help us to expand our minds, to bridge divides, to think about things differently, and to hear others' perspectives on issues that might make us a little uncomfortable, but in the end that I think will help us relate to each other with more empathy and more compassion. And so on this season of the Patchwork Podcast, I've been really intentional to book some of the world's leading experts on issues that are way out of my league personally, issues that I don't know a ton about, but that I want to learn about because I think are important to this moment of where we stand as a people collectively. And so this season, you're going to hear from scientists, you're going to hear from pastors, you're going to hear from politicians, you're going to hear from historians, you're going to hear from wealth management experts, you're going to hear from people on the far right and people on the far left and a lot of moderates in between. And my hope is that whether or not you think that the topic or the perspective is worth listening to, that you'll listen to it anyways, that you'll lean in with me to these conversations and allow yourself to be surprised, to be expanded, to be challenged, to hear another person's perspective on an issue that you might not have thought about in a long time or thought that your views were solidified on. Because I really, really, really do believe that it's by listening in to people who see things differently or see things from a unique perspective, that that's how we grow individually. And as we allow ourselves to be growing and our minds to be expanding and our spirits to be expanding individually, that we'll be able to go out into culture and engage with the same kind of empathy, with the same kind of curiosity that's being cultivated, hopefully, on this podcast. And that might just begin to bring healing to our polarized world. So I hope you're uh, going to listen in, that you're going to engage deeply, and that you're going to be really inspired, challenged, and provoked to be bridge builders by the content that you hear on Patchwork Season 2. And today I'm really excited for this first conversation of this new season, because today I got to chat with a guy named Dr. Daniel Immerwar, who wrote a book called How to Hide an Empire, the History of the Greater United States. This book came out in June of 2019, and it's a controversial book, and it's a book that teaches us a history that I certainly didn't learn in my high school American history class. It's about how the United States, really from our inception, has not just been happy with being this country across the sea from Britain, but has this desire, has this impulse from our very origins to be an empire that colonizes nations around the world, whether that's through putting military bases at over 800 locations in countries around the world, to actually taking territories of countries and islands around the world and 
um, using these islands and these people that live there for our own benefit while denying them constitutional rights. It's an incredible history. It's a shocking history. It's a saddening and maddening history. But today, as we listen in, I hope that you will listen closely, that you will, um, I play devil's advocate a little bit with Dr. Imrawar, so I hope you'll try to see maybe the other perspective of this conversation, those who do support America's imperialistic agenda, and that all in all, at the end of this conversation, we'll be stretched and we will have learned a great deal about a topic that's important, that matters in the 21st century in 2019 America. I mean, it was just this week, actually, that the president of the United States, Doc, Donald Trump, I was about to call him Dr. Donald Trump, that was laughable. Anyways, that Donald Trump uh, wanted to buy Greenland, which, as absurd as that sounds, is actually kind of a part of America's imperial uh, prerogative that we've had for the entirety of our history. And so it's actually on the topic of President Trump wanting to buy Greenland that I begin my conversation with Dr. Imawar. So without further ado, let's listen in to today's conversation with Dr. Daniel Imawar, the author of How to Hide an Empire, the History of the Greater United States. And the first thing I kind of want to know is how does someone get into history in general? Like what made you decide to pursue the path of being a historian? And then why did you start initially looking up this idea of the empire of America, Amer American colonialism around the world? Yeah, I think I got into history the way a lot of people get into it um, in college. I, I took these extraordinary history classes um, with at Columbia University with people like Eric Foner. And I just remember being in the audience thinking, this is the sound of the world making sense to me. This is the sound of things that I didn't get before suddenly just opening themselves up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all kinds of branches of learning do that in various ways for various people, but that was the thing that did it for me. Um, and, and so I was, you know, from the United States, I'm from Pennsylvania and I was interested in U.S. history, so I, I kind of went out to to do that, and I I got was getting a doctoral degree in it, and I was teaching it. I was teaching it um, in a prison, and I was teaching it at Berkeley, where I was getting my doctorate. And I would I sort of teach these U.S. history classes, uh, and you know they, they 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 went they went fine, but I ended up going to the Philippines hmm. for other research not related to um, the book that that I want to talk to you about today, and and I I remember just being in Manila. And just sort of looking around and, and, and being struck by this family resemblance that I wasn't really expecting. I'd known that the Philippines had been a colony of the United States, but I think there's a difference between reading the lyrics and hearing the music. And suddenly, you know, I'm on streets that are named after U.S. presidents. I'm taking a transit system that's uh, designed around uh, surplus U.S. Army jeeps. I'm going to, uh, you know, this prestigious university. I'm hearing people talk English with basically my accent. Um, and, and that was a kind of revelatory experience for me and, and one that made me think that, you know, as much as I'd enjoyed teaching U.S. history, that I probably wasn't doing it right because there wasn't actually a place for the Philippines in the story of the United States as I was telling it. Uh, and then I, you know, didn't take me too long to realize, well, where's Hawaii in this story? Where's Puerto Rico in this story? Where's Guam? And, and I just, I, I felt like I had just been getting it wrong. So I, scurried back uh, to, well, you know, you might say, the, you know, I scurried back to the United States. And, and then I just started pulling all the books off the library shelves and realizing there was this incredibly rich history, uh, that despite having a doctorate in U.S. history, that I hadn't really known. Yeah, totally. And it, it's surprising, as I've looked through the book, it's history that we haven't learned, by and large, as people who've grown up in American education systems. I just I know I've never heard about it in any of my uh, general education history classes. And I also, I think it's timely that we're talking this week because uh, just in the past uh, week or two, our current president has talked about wanting to expand this empire by purchasing Greenland. And so it's interesting as much as we kind of laugh about that, and it is a laughable statement from the president, but there is a historical precedent, obviously, of America going around the world and trying to purchase or colonize um, lands all over the place. And 
obviously that's kind of the whole narrative of the book but can you talk a little bit about why when how america started getting into this empire making business yeah it depends on how you define it but by one reasonable definition the united states was an empire the empire business from day one so from the first day that the united states' independence from britain was ratified by both sides the, the treaty was ratified uh, it wasn't as the name suggests a, a union of states it was an amalgam it was it was states but it also had these other entities in it territories and they were to be governed by the central government and have less representation uh, than the states would. Uh, that was day one of the United States, and uh, that's how it is now. Uh, the United States has five inhabited territories today, millions of people live in them, and that's how it's been every day in between. So every day of US history, there have been states and territories. Um, as you probably know, the, the story of the Western states is at least from the perspective of the white settlers who lived in them, you know, less of a sort of colonialism story because those states, once they filled up with white settlers, um, and let's be clear, dislodged indigenous people in doing so, uh, and often a violent process. Mm. Uh, but once once those states were filled up with, with white settlers, they were admitted as states. They were sort of promoted uh, and admitted on equal footing. But that hasn't been the case for all the territories. Um, the United States um, starting in the 1850s, started expanding overseas, first taking uninhabited islands in the Caribbean and Pacific, uh, then Alaska by the end of the 19th century, uh, as a result of the war with Spain, taking the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and American Samoa, later taking the U.S. Virgin Islands. So the United States has actually had a really sizable colonial empire, and one that has ranked alongside you know, the great empires of the world. Yeah, wow. And do you think, I mean, Again, so this is such a massive amount of people. It's a massive amount of land. And I think most Americans are fairly uneducated and uninformed about this. Do you think that's intentional? Is it intentional that our history books in our public schools leave this stuff out or at least skim over it? Um, why do you think we don't know more about this? Yeah, let me say a little bit about those the, the presumptions before I answer your question. Um, when you, you're entirely right when you said we're talking about a lot of people. Let's just be clear. In um, 1940, which is around the apex of the United States' colonial empire, it had other forms of empire, and we might talk about that. Um, if you lived in the United States, meaning not just the contiguous blob, not just what people in the territories call the mainland, but the entire thing. So if you lived in the United States then, there was a one in eight chance that you were colonized. That's how many colonized people there are in the U.S. polity. And that's, that means more colonized people uh, than there are African Americans, more colonized people than there are immigrants. It's, it's a huge part of the population of U.S. nationals. Um, and then the other part of your question was, why don't we know about it in our textbooks? And I think it's probably useful to just sort of interrogate that, that word we, because there are some people in the United States who know this very well. Those people live in Puerto Rico and Guam. It's absolutely, yeah. you know, not a hidden history um, from those places. But for me, it was, right? I grew up in Pennsylvania. I never saw a map of the United States that had Puerto Rico on it. Puerto Rico wasn't any part of the history that I learned. And I don't think it's a conspiracy. I don't think the textbook educators are getting, some of whom I know, are getting together and saying, you know, how can we suppress this information? Um, but I think that the story of, of the United States' territorial empire doesn't really fit into um, the understanding of, of U.S. foreign policy, or even the understanding of the United States as most people understand it. Most people, if you ask them what the United States is, like what does it look like, and if, if you map it in your head, the, the, the shape that you call the mind is the contiguous blob, maybe with Alaska and Hawaii part of it. And so when you know, textbook authors get out to writing the story, the history of the United States, they write the history of that shape. But, you know, those aren't actually the borders of the United States, and they've only been the borders of the United States, those contiguous borders, for like three years in U.S. history. Yeah. And what's interesting is that, so we, we kind of talk about um, the, this empire being the United States empire, and yet most of these places that the United States has colonized, they don't have the same rights as American citizens. The Constitution doesn't apply to most of these people in most of these places. Can you talk a little bit about the history and debate around that and why that's significant that these people aren't covered by our Constitution? It's really important to recognize. So right after the sort of uh, imperial shopping spree that the United States went on 
uh, in the late 19th century as a result of that 1898 war with Spain, suddenly the question, the, the, the country really had to reckon with the question of empire and reckon with it in a way, in a more forthright way than it ever had before. And uh, the question became, you know, what is the nature of this country? And, and does the constitution apply to the Philippines? Does the Bill of Rights apply in Hawaii? Uh, these were large and populous places, but they didn't have large white populations. And they didn't look like they were about to have large white populations as the Western territories had. Um, and so the Supreme Court took up the issue uh, in a series of cases. Uh, they're called the insular cases. And what it decided was that, and this is um, uh, quoting from one of the justices nearly directly, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, okay? But a lot of these overseas territories are not part of the land in a constitutional sense. So the Constitution doesn't fully extend to them, which is why you can be born in American Samoa today uh, you're born in the United States, and the 14th Amendment says that if you're born in the United States, you're a U.S. citizen, but not in American Samoa, because the 14th Amendment doesn't extend there, because um, the, uh, the entire Constitution does not automatically extend uh, to the territories. That's why, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, you have a right to trial by jury, and that right is backstopped by the Constitution. Well, that's true if you're in California or if you're in Illinois, where I am. But if I were to go to San Juan right now, I would lose that right because of the, you know, that constitutional right doesn't extend to Puerto Rico. Um, and it's also, we should be clear, that's not, that's independent of citizenship. So if you're born in Puerto Rico, you're a U.S. citizen, but you're not a constitutionally sort of guaranteed U.S. citizen and you don't have all the constitutional rights that U.S. citizens do in the mainland. So let me just push for understanding there, because because it sounds, it probably is absurd as you made it, like it sounds absurd that... These territories are part of the United States for all intents and purposes. We are utilizing them. Um, we are utilizing their resources. We're even at, for some or most of these places, extending citizenship. But how, how do we arrive at this decision that just because they're not a part of what we understand to be the United States, um, when we think of the picture in our head, how do, how do we justify not extending constitutional rights to these citizens of these places? The original justification was straightforward, that the people who live in the overseas territories are different, are alien races. I mean, the logic was explicitly racial and frankly explicitly racist, uh, and therefore a different kind of government is appropriate for a different kind of people. Um, the same court that made that decision to split the space of the United States into two parts a constitutional zone and an extra constitutional zone where different races would live. Uh, this, that's the same court that decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which is the infamous case uh, that allowed Jim Crow segregation, which, which said that the country could be administratively split, you know, with one school system for white children and one other school system for non-white, for my primarily black children. The difference is this. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson is, was overturned by Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s and is now regarded as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions, uh, something that warped the Constitution and deprived millions of U.S. citizens of their rights. Uh, the insular cases, those are still good law. They are still on the books. They're being challenged today in the courts, but you know, thus far they've been upheld. Oh, and this probably shows my own ignorance about this, but are there movements within these uh, territories to have constitutional protection or to break away from the United States? Like, is that something that's happening actively in these places? Yeah, there's, um, there's a rich status conversation that takes place in all of the inhabited U.S. territories today, all five. Uh, but it looks different in the different territories. Um, so you'll find, you know, in Puerto Rico, for example, um, there's a really heated debate over what the desired status for Puerto Rico should be. Should it be statehood? Um, should it be some kind of modified version of what Puerto Rico has now? So carving out a, a zone of autonomy for Puerto Rico, but keeping it part of the United States? Or should it be independence? Um, there's you know, significantly fewer people who, you know, in a vote would vote for independence as far as we can tell. Uh, but nevertheless, that's still a big part of sort of Puerto Rican culture and especially um, Puerto Rican intellectual culture. Totally. And so uh, let me play devil's advocate, because clearly we're articulating this. It sounds like the United States has, by and large, been engaging in, as we've been saying, colonialism, like a, a morally despicable action of taking over land and not extending rights to the people there. 
But there are those who would argue that it's the prerogative of the dominant power to take over the territories. And it's actually beneficial to these territories that we are overseeing their rule and that we're um, offering them benefits they wouldn't otherwise have. And I've also read the argument that it's better, right, that the United States has these territories and offers a, a sense of democracy to them rather than a power like China taking them. Um, how would you respond to that from a historical perspective? So that's a theory that there are some people who are just better at government than other people. Uh, so, you know, usually we think that um, representative governments work pretty well because people who are affected by decisions, um, you know, have a lot of stake in those decisions and, and have a lot of information about those decisions and therefore should have a voice in making the decisions. But there's another theory, which is some people are better than government and others. And um, despite the fact that, you know, Puerto Ricans are in Puerto Rico uh, and are concerned with Puerto Rican affairs. Uh, mainlanders are better at government. This is the theory, not mine. Uh, and therefore, they should be in charge of Puerto Rican affairs because Puerto Ricans can't be trusted. Or similarly, uh, because of a fear that if Puerto Rico were not affiliated with the United States, it might somehow be governed by China and also Chinese people can't be trusted. Um, I don't really buy that theory. And I think it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that when you say out loud, you know, sounds pretty questionable, sounds yeah. pretty racist. Um, but let's talk about it historically. Um, we can look at the historical record. And, you know, history is complicated. And I'm not saying the United States didn't, you know, do anything interesting in its colonies, didn't, you know, establish schools or, um, you know, uh, help, help uh, public with help public health campaigns. But um, there are moments in the United States' colonial history that are just so painful to contemplate because these are the moments when you can just see what happens when the people doing the governing don't have any attachment to the people who are being governed. Mm -hmm. And in my book, uh, one story I tell is World War II in the Philippines. And, you know, if you grew up like I did and read about World War II in textbooks, you probably think that, you know, the only time the United States was ever even attacked on its own soil in World War II was Pearl Harbor at Hawaii, uh, and then the rest of the fight was over there. Well, actually, um, you know, a lot of the fight happened in the United States' specific territories, which were occupied by Japan and then, sort of, you know, uh, reconquered by the United States, uh, particularly the Philippines, which was the largest colony the United States ever held. That fighting was absolutely brutal. So uh, we think that 1.1 million Filipinos died in World War II. 1.6 uh, million people died overall. So that's a lot of Japanese people as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's two civil wars. That's the most violent thing that has ever happened on U.S. soil. And here's the rub. A lot of that death, a lot of those fatalities came from friendly fire both from the United States are not fortifying uh, its own colony out of a, a disregard for ultimately for the lives of Filipinos. But mm -hmm. then when the United States was reconquering the Philippines, it bombed and shelled its own cities, including virtually leveling Manila, which at this point was the sixth largest city in the United States. It had a million U.S. nationals in it. Uh, and, you know, as those buildings went down, a lot of Filipino lives were lost. One-tenth of the uh, population of Manila, which again was one million people, uh, you know, was lost in a single month of, of just a vortex of carnage. And that's the kind of thing that happens when the government who's, you know, ostensibly supposed to be protecting you, in this case Washington, uh, feels way less attachment uh, to your welfare uh, than a, a local government might. Totally. And I think the conversation over the past few years, um, we once again, we being people here in the mainland in the United States, we're becoming aware again of just how much white supremacy has been a part of the fundamental way the United States have operated in the world. But looking and reading through your book and seeing these accounts, it just becomes so overt that even as you're describing that story, you're right, that it's okay for the United States to bomb the Philippines because they're not European white Americans, even though they're American citizens. And I think one of the interesting stories that you tell um, that kind of puts this in a modern perspective is that you talk about the 2008 election being this kind of point, this boiling point, um, this point of contention where uh, two candidates represented two different imperial notions within the United States. I know I'm kind of butchering the way I'm saying that, but can you talk to me a bit about 2008, how that election between John McCain and Barack Obama really brought this idea of American uh, imperialism to the forefront? Sure. Well, it's interesting because in some ways, uh, the election, that's, it's such an important election, right? The, the, uh, the election of Obama feels like 
the moment when modern politics started. Yeah. Like, you know, everything that after that, you know, the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, Trump, birtherism, like it all just feels like it, it, it started with, with, uh, with, with the 2008 election. Um, and that's how we usually talk about it. You know, we usually talk about sort of progressivism versus conservatism, racism, the sort of partisan divisions in the country. Uh, but from my perspective, boy, that election was all about colonialism. And, and I think it's hard for us to see that. So, so let me break it down. Uh, on the one hand, you've got John McCain, who's running to be president. And uh, to be president, you have to be a natural born citizen. So says the constitution. Uh, John McCain was born in the Panama Canal Zone. Okay, so is he, is he a natural born citizen? Well, um, you know, his parents are citizens. So that should make him a citizen. But at the time, there was no law that said if your parents were citizens and you were born in the Panama Canal Zone, you were a citizen. There was a law that covered that if you were born abroad, but John McCain wasn't born abroad. And if you were born in the United States, you should be covered by the 14th Amendment. But for reasons we just discussed, the Panama Canal Zone wasn't covered by the 14th Amendment either. So uh, Congress actually had this moment in the 1930s where they, they said, oh, uh, people in, you know, born to citizen parents in the Panama Canal Zone are not citizens. And should they be? And you know, Congress had a discussion about it and decided yes, and passed a law in 1937 saying, uh, if you were born in this condition, you are a U.S. citizen. And and also that applies retrospectively. So people who had been born in this way uh, were U.S. citizens. That law is passed in 1937, and John McCain is born in 1936. So at when he is born, no law makes him a U.S. citizen. Um, so you know, this is like exactly the kind of legal loophole that mars the U.S. empire. And John McCain, just because he sort of, you know, his parents were, were in the Panama Canal Zone when he was born, you know, got dinged by it. Um, it didn't become a major issue for him. He's white. He's a military hero. Um, you know, kind of came up. People didn't really understand the full legal argument. Uh, but, but then think about his, uh, his running mate, Sarah Palin. Uh, she wasn't born in Alaska, but she was uh, taken there as a newborn, grew up, fell in love with uh, Todd Palin, this oil worker, and they got married. Um, and we don't always talk about this, but Todd Palin um, is part Yupik. Todd Palin is, um, is Alaskan, legally is an Alaskan native. Uh, and also the Palin children are legally Alaska natives with all the rights and privileges uh, that come to Alaska natives. Uh, and, uh, you know, Sarah Palin would sort of, you know, brag about this when she was running for governor. Hers was a mixed family. It was, you know, white settlers and, and, and natives uh, came together in her family. Uh, but there was one twist that was kind of, you know, tricky, which is that Todd Palin was also a member of um, the Alaskan Independence Movement or the Alaskan Independence Party, um, which which argued that because Alaska natives hadn't been able to vote on Alaska statehood, statehood was illegitimate, and there should be a new vote, maybe leading toward independence. So this is a sort of like post-colonial uh, secessionist party mm -hmm. that Todd Palin was a member of, and Sarah Palin had had gone to their meetings and seemed to be supportive. So I mean, that's an incredible issue. Again, Sarah Palin was white; it did become a huge deal but it did become a big deal for Barack Obama. So he's also not born on the U.S. mainland. He's born in Hawaii uh, right after Hawaii is made a state. So he doesn't have the McCain problem. Uh, and Hawaii has this huge sovereignty uh, 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 movement, but uh, Obama doesn't deal with it, doesn't engage with it. So he doesn't have the uh, Palin problem. But nevertheless, because he's born in Polynesia, because he's not born in the mainland, there's this kind of general sense that Maybe he's not really fully American somehow. He also have a, has a, a really highly mixed family. He's got you know Asian uh, strains and African strains and, 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 and European strains. And that's not atypical for uh, Polynesia, not atypical for Hawaii particularly, but it's kind of odd for the mainland. So he just kind of reads as foreign. Um, and, and in my book, I tell the story about first how people are sort of identifying him as foreign because of where he's born. And then how that, that identification mutates into, into a rumor, uh, which is that he's not a natural born citizen because um, he's secretly born in Kenya. Um, and I'll just point this out. That rumor is the um, entry point for Donald Trump into viable presidential politics. He'd run for president before, but no one had ever taken him seriously. This is the thing that, that puts the spotlight on him. And so you just kind of take a step back and you think, oh my God, McCain, Palin, Obama, Trump, like every one of these people has been touched in some deep and consequential way by the politics of colonialism. And we don't really see it because when we think about the United States, we just see the local, we just see the sort of mainland and we don't really see the full United States and appreciate how that sort of geographical spread of the country informs, you know, history at the, in the most central way. Well, 
I think that story is so profound and fascinating and it is mind boggling to me that most people at least don't know the McCain Palin side of that story. And uh, why do you, th- why do you think it's just been so downplayed and yet Barack Obama's um, citizenship became such a center point of the 2008 election other than overt racism? I, I mean, I think even people who wouldn't engage in overt racism using the N word and that kind of thing, um, nevertheless have a racially informed sense of uh, what it is to be an American and what places are really fundamentally, um, you know, quote unquote, America. Uh, I mean, in my book, I talk constantly, you know, throughout the book about uh, the ways in which mainlanders kept dismissing the overseas parts, overseas territories of the United States as yeah, I guess technically they're part of the country, but you know, come on, they're not really part of the country. Um, and that that dismissal, that sense that there's a um, you know these these parts of the country that are subordinated, that they don't really count, where people's lives don't really matter. Um, that's been lethal in the case of, as I just described, the Philippines in World War II. Uh, but it's been consequential throughout. And what's amazing is that you can still see that logic operating uh, in very recent politics, as as people looked at Barack Obama a mixed race man born in Polynesia and just said, yeah, it doesn't quite count. Not yeah. quite there. Wow. And kind of like the, the last thing I want to make sure we touch on is that, so we talk about these territories, these overt territories that the United States has claim over, but the U S also has, and you touch on this uh, quite extensively. We have 800 overseas military bases while other world powers like Russia only has nine. And so it seems like our imperial presence um, is extending through these military bases around the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, I th- by the way, I think Russia's number is rising. The last I checked, it had 21, oh. but, you know, China has one. And, you know, and the United States, as far as we can tell, is 800. So, I mean, it is just yeah. an enormous uh, asymmetry. Yeah, it's true. Um, if you look at the, uh, the footprint of power today, it doesn't look like powerful countries claiming large swaths of territory like the United States did when it was expanding across North America or expanding in the Pacific and in the Caribbean and into the Arctic. Um, you know, that, that model of, um, of land grabs is over, but that doesn't mean that territory isn't important. And one thing that it's really easy not to think very hard about is the fact that um, the United States isn't just, you know, uh, the states and the overseas territories. It's also these like 800 or so enclaves over which the Stars and Stripes flies and the United States has jurisdiction and can kind of do whatever it wants. Um, and, and those have been really important in world history, um, partly because they're perceived by a lot of countries where these bases are stationed as, as, as a difficult imposition. Um, and so in the book, I, I talk about uh, that, being, that, 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 that issue of the United States sort of putting its, its enclaves and outposts in other people's countries um, being the issue that, that ultimately sparked um, Osama bin Laden's jihad against the United States uh, and Al Qaeda, and, and and therefore the war on terror. We're, we're living in a world whose politics are shaped by the fact that the United States has these little dots just all over the map. And you know, geographically, if you take all of the military base sites and you add them all together, uh, you know, they don't add up to much more area than Houston. But boy, are they important! And it would be you know a great peril to sort of look at the map and not see them and not realize uh, how much our present politics are shaped by them. Yeah. And it seems like American citizens, at least I'm just trying to think of it from a general perspective, that we feel safer in some regard because we know we have all of these military enclaves around the world, even though um, it seems like there are many people that, like you said, feel like this is an imposition. Um, And I wonder, uh, it it seems like we do a lot of justifying of a lot of um, terrible behavior around the world for the sake of our own national security. And I wonder, are there any places, is it by and large, these countries, do they feel like when we have a military base there that it is an imposition, that it is a, a threat to them? Or do, I, do a majority of these countries feel like having an American base there is actually extending protection to them? Or is that a bad read? No, it's not. It's not. It's a complicated issue. So first of all, you know, the United States does not impose bases by force. It comes to agreements with government. But of course, those agreements are made with massive asymmetries of power. And the United States has this enormous military that really has no other parallel in the world. And, you know, the bases are offered 
as one of the things the bases offer is a form of protection that you, you know you are part of the United States' military empire if you host a U.S. base. Um, the bases offer uh, economic benefits. Uh, there's a lot of business that happens in and around the bases. A lot of contracting. A lot of you know, especially in poor countries, people you know, the base is just a sort of enclave of, of relatively extremely rich people. Uh, you know, people who who need things from from the uh, surrounding country. Uh, so. And, and, you know, and there are complicated economic transactions. Sometimes the United States uh, pays for the base, or sometimes actually the host countries pay uh, for the, you know, privilege of protection. Nevertheless, um, despite the, the really, truly complicated politics of, of hosting bases, uh, it seems pretty constant that the people in those countries who live near the bases, um, you know, both often work on the bases, so have something to get out of them, but also uh, find those bases to be a, a, a kind of imposition and, and often describe those bases as a form of colonialism. Because it's, of course they do, because, you know, think about what would happen in the United States if the Chinese had a base in Texas. Just like, mm. just, just think about how that would read. Yeah. Maybe it would be economically beneficial. Maybe it would offer some military protection. It would still be a little weird and it would still be an uncomfortable thing. Um, you know, and you said that people in the United States kind of think about these bases as offering protection. Um, and I'd say two things back to that. Um, one is, it's not clear to me that the cost of U.S. security is, is worth, you know, these kinds of impositions on, on the rest of the world. Mm. And two, it's really not clear to me uh, how much the bases do offer protection. Because on the one hand, they extend the reach of the U.S. military, and that seems like that should protect the United States and its interests. But on the other hand, they piss a lot of people off. Mm. And uh, that's dangerous for the United yeah. States. And then they offer these little targets uh, for, uh, for people to, 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 take, to take out. I mean, before Al-Qaeda was in the business of attacking the U.S. mainland, it would attack you know, whatever enclaves of U.S. power it could find. And that included you know, battleships and bases and embassies, mm. uh, places that were sprinkled through uh, you know, Africa and the Middle East, uh, places that, that were easier to reach, but then would draw the United States into a protracted and violent and, and dangerous conflict. Well, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, that tension between at least visibly extending our reach and protection, but also really disturbing those countries and the people in them. I think that's something that needs to be considered. And I'm so grateful for your book, How to Hide an Empire, for the way that it has raised this to my consciousness. And I know many other people's because, again, this is history that we're not uh, familiar with in a way that we need to be, especially as um more and more of us wake up to um, the problem of colonialism, the problem of white supremacy. And as we try to address it, I think understanding the American imperial um, push is really important. And so just kind of the last question is, when a general person from the public reads your book, what is the one big takeaway that you're hoping everyone gets when they uh, pick up a copy of How to Hide an Empire? The takeaway, I think, is spatial. I want uh, my readers, you know, to, to be able to look at the United States and not just see in their heads the contiguous blob of states and think that that's the country and that's, you know, the, the frame for the national history. I want them to realize that the United States' borders have been dancing across the world map, uh, you know, since the 19th century and that, you know, whether it be in the form of overseas colonies, military occupations or, uh, or bases, that the United States has, has had flags in the sky and boots on the ground all over the planet. And that if you really want to understand the United States and its history, you have to understand its shape and you have to understand that we're not just talking about that contiguous blob. We're talking about something larger, the greater United States. Hmm. Well, your book certainly does that. And again, the book is called How to Hide an Empire, the History of the Greater United States by Dr. Daniel Immerwar. And Dr. Immerwar, thank you so much for taking some time to be with me today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The Patchwork Podcast is brought to you in part by Metanoia, a center for spiritual and social renewal, and Mission Gathering San Diego, a progressive, inclusive Christian church.